Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Fourth of July to you. We celebrate a big holiday in our country, and we celebrate the, the, the courage that our forefathers and mothers had in the revolution and the declaration of their independence, their work for us in that. And we know the cost of freedom, not just then, but uh, all the way along. I'm wondering how many of you in the room have fireworks every year on your birthday. <laughs> Can we say happy birthday to Sam Leip? Today is his birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, Sam. <laughs> what a great day. I, I know other people in the congregation that would say, if I could pick my birthday, it would be July 4th, because everybody's already partying. So it's a great, great thing. Some announcements that we have. Uh, we did our weekly prayer time every Wednesday in June. We'll be hitting the pause button on that to see what unfolds in September, that we've got some decisions to make as a congregation about what our Wednesday schedule might be, like coming back to in-person worship. We don't know what that's gonna be or when, but weekly prayer time could be impacted by those decisions. So we will not be having weekly prayer time until at least September. Uh, one other thing, and we could put this in joys and concerns as a joy, when I get done with my work at the end of the day today, I'm going on vacation for a week. Okay, smiling, nodding, thank you. Yeah, he's going away. That, wait, that's a mixed message, people. Um, so the good news is that Gretchen Barron will be here to preach next Sunday. So I know that uh, we enjoy Gretchen and her preaching, and I talked with her yesterday. She's looking forward to being here next Sunday. If you're willing and able, would you please stand for our call to worship? God's greatness is wondrous to behold. Everywhere we look, we can of God. In spacious skies and amber waves of grain, from the loftiest mountains to the crashing waters of the sea, there's God's greatness stands majestically. God's greatness is within the human heart and in the soul of our nation. Let, Let us honor and praise God, God with acts of loving kindness and compassion. And compassion. Amen. Amen. To our hymn of praise, God of the Ages. for 
Our scripture today comes from Psalm 31, verses 19 through 24. Oh, how abundant is your goodness that you have laid up for those who fear you and accomplished for those who take refuge in you in the sight of everyone. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from human plots. You hold them safe under your shelter from contentious tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was beset as a city under siege. I had said in my alarm, I am driven far from your sight, but you heard my supplications when I cried out to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts haughtily. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to this hearing of his holy word. Today is the 4th of July. I'm sure you realize that over 200 years ago, a group of colonists came together to declare their independence from England. But this independence wouldn't have been possible without their interdependence upon each other. They had to rely on each other in order to declare this independence. If they had gone each their own way, we would have never had an independent country. The same is true in the church, too. We are independent Christians, but unless we come together, unless we work together, the church will not succeed. Every Sunday we have an opportunity to show our interdependence upon each other when we bring forth our weekly offering. It's a time where we show that we need each other and that the church needs us. So today, I, I remind you that you bring your offering and put it in the plate right here in front of me, but we do so showing our dependence, but also showing our interdependence upon each other. Thank you.
Dear God, we come before you today with grateful hearts that you allowed us to inherit this great nation and the freedoms we take for granted way, way too often. May you help us to learn interdependence. May you help us to lead us into a state where we realize that we need each other, both in this nation and in this church, and help us learn to be not individuals, but to work for the common good. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. invite you to pull the bulletin insert from your bulletin to look at our prayer list. Joe Gino is at Memorial Hospital and his wife Linda and son Joe are with us today. So prayers for the Gino family as Joe is getting care there. There's a young boy named Isaiah who's in the hospital and they're doing a lot of tests, and it's still a mystery um, what the diagnosis is for him. So we lift Isaiah and his family this morning. Uh, my wife's aunt, Dorothy Salee, is in her last hours and days, has been in hospice for the last month or so. She's in Bloomington. And a joy this morning is to have Lily and Elena Heights providing vocal music for us. So. Thank you. Just, just her. Just. just, her. just yeah. Just I, her, I, I, I'm sure I only heard one voice. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's lovely. A great day for music. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Let's go to God in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the blessing of this day and for the blessing, the celebration of this holiday. We pray for our nation this day, for its health, for its well-being, for its bright future. Help each one of us to play a part in a healthy nation moving forward. God, we thank you for this time of worship that we can draw near to one another and to you. We're grateful for the many blessings that you pour into our lives each day. Help us to pay attention and help us to always be grateful. Loving God, you know the concerns that are on our minds and in our hearts. So we lift these prayers to you in moments of silence, remembering names, remembering situations. God, we don't always know what to pray. Sometimes being quiet is our best prayer. In these moments, O oh God, may we sense your leading, your nudging, and your loving presence for us and for others. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, what brings us to our communion time is the philosophy of Winnie the Pooh, one of the great philosophers of our time. He is attributed to saying this, the past is history, the future is a mystery, and the present is a gift, and that's why they call it the present. The point for us today is that we can be mindful, that we can be present in this moment. That today we could come to this communion table without any regrets of the past and without any worries for the future. We can just be here, focused on this present moment, receiving the gift of God the gift of God's love that we know through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is our host. He invites us here. So gratefully, we accept that invitation. Gratefully, we receive these elements. The love is abundant in these moments. Let's remember that Jesus, on that night with his disciples, he had shared a meal, and then he took bread, and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in a like way, he took the cup and after he blessed it, he passed it to them and said, drink of this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to appreciate this invitation to commune with you and your followers and to experience your living presence at this meal. In remembering the Christ whose body was broken and blood shed for us, help us our, affirm our faith in you who called us to take up your cross and follow me. Help us to live up to this calling. Help us to live as your faithful people, one in the unity of love poured out for us on Calvary. Give us the guidance we need to follow your path, the strength and courage we need to take up your cross, and the grace we need to be Christ's people in a difficult world. In Jesus' name, amen. In this holy moment, let us partake of the meal together.
Thank you, David, for these beautiful arrangements today. There's an author by the name of Stephen Covey, well-known. He wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and lots and lots of other books since then. I think I took the training maybe 20, 25 years ago. It made me a better person. But to make a point, one day he told a story about a group of people standing on the roof of a skyscraper. And there was a board going from that skyscraper to the skyscraper next door. And you could stand at the edge of the roof and look down and see the chasm between the two buildings. And the person said, there's a million dollars at the other building if you will walk across on the board and get that. How many people do you think said yes to that? Uh, zero. He said, let's change it up then. Let's change that scenario. And we say, a child, your child, is on the other side, on that other building, and they need you to rescue them. How many people would say yes? More than zero, right? You'd like to think 100%. <laughs> Some say, I, I'll use the million dollars to pay somebody to get my kid. <laughs> But what we value the most fuels our courage. What we care about is what makes us courageous. And that's what we're going to talk about today in the sermon. Will you pray with me? God, help us to hear this morning the makings of courage. Help us to learn from your word. Help us to bring that word to the present day, to our own individual lives and our life together as church. God, there is so much more that we can learn, that we can know, that can change our lives. Help us this day to receive you anew. Gratefully, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. So if you look at your bulletin cover this morning, you'll see today we've reached the end of our sermon series. This is the last installment of We Are the Church, and our topic, of course, is courage. Last week, we went on missionary journeys with Paul, talked about all the challenges that he faced as he traveled from city to city delivering the good news. And we know that he wasn't always warmly welcomed wherever he went, especially by the church leaders and some of the leaders in government. But what we saw on his part was persistence, perseverance. So we want to look at those missionary journeys today through the lens of courage. He knew that this was important work for him to do. He knew that God had sent him to do this work and that the Holy Spirit was traveling right alongside and that this was a work of life and death, not just for him, but for so many others. Here's a Nelson Mandela quote. I learned that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man or woman is not the one who does not feel afraid, but is the one who conquers that fear. Not that fear goes away, but that in the midst of fear, we do the right thing. So let's walk a mile or a minute in Paul's sandals this morning. And really the question is, what would you do if you knew something was going to be dangerous? If you had experience like Paul had and thought, okay, here's the scenario. I walk into the city, I preach at the temple, people get really excited, and we say, see you next week at the temple. And by the time the next week rolls around, there's all this opposition, people arguing against him, people plotting against him, you know, having a trial in the temple because what he's speaking 
is blasphemy. And you think, okay, what's it going to be in this city? Is it going to be just arguing? Is it going to be beatings? Is it going to be personal attacks? Is it going to be an arrest? If you were Paul, what would you do? You say, well, I've got a little common sense, and I would know to go to the next town and say, see you, everybody. I'll be back when things calm down a little bit, even though I'm the one that got things riled up, right? What's great for Paul is that he's in close contact with God, that he has a sense of God's message for him of what he is to do. In Acts 23, 11, we hear these words, Paul sensing from God these words, keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also in Rome. So that's kind of the, the telling of what's going to happen, and we know that Paul has been in a lot of scrapes before this. <clears throat> So he's back in Jerusalem, and we know from reading other parts of the Bible that he has collected an offering from all of these other churches around to give to the Christians in need in Jerusalem. Okay, We see that even in uh, the, the letters to the Corinthians, that he's gathering those funds. So he's back home. This is the hometown boy, and he's seeing his Christian friends in the Christian community. He's also seeing people he knows in the temple. So it was those in the temple that put him on trial. That's what we're reading about in Acts chapter 23. So listen to these words, verses 6 through 11. Paul in the temple. When Paul noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angel or spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all three. Then a great clamor arose, and certain scribes of the Pharisees' group stood up and contended, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? When the dissension became violent, the tribunal, fearing that they would tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. That night, the Lord stood near him and said, quote, Keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also in Rome. May God bless to our understanding and faith these words of Holy Scripture. Now, you know how much I love to read Scripture, and I would love to read the whole chapter, but I'm just going to go back to the first couple of verses to make a point in chapter 23, while Paul was looking intently at the council, brothers, up to this day I have lived my life with a clear conscience before God. Then the high priest, Ananias, ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. It's already violent. You know, think, where is it going from here? And Paul plays on the division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and reminds them that he has the credential of a Pharisee. But that is not keeping him safe. He is telling his truth. He is boldly speaking the good news. And then things get rougher. If we look on in Acts 23, 12 to 20, I'm, I'm sorry, 12 to 22 to 40, we see that there is a plot, that there are 40 Jewish men plotting to kill Paul. And they're working that out with the leaders in the temple, saying, okay, we know tomorrow he's going to go by this path, and we can get him then. So they are going to kill him. They are going to take him out. 
But there are other church leaders saying, we need to protect this guy because he's also not just a Pharisee, but a Roman citizen. So they call on the Roman soldiers to say, take this guy away. We know someone wants to kill him. They didn't want his Roman citizen blood on their hands. So the soldiers come, take him, you see, to the barracks, to what I would call protective custody, okay? But he's still under arrest. It's not like he's a friend of the Romans. He is under arrest. So the journey continues. And when we read on in Rome, we see that he has a long trip to Rome, and he's in prison in Rome after that. So there are going to be more and more stories of courage as we read on in the book of Acts. So I'm wondering what kind of stories of courage you have in your life. When was a time that you were very afraid and something important needed to be done and you had a decision to make? I can remember preaching my first funeral back in 1990, I think it was, and I was scared to death. I was sitting at the church. It's like three doors north of the funeral home. It's 10 minutes before the funeral is to start. And the funeral director calls the church and says, so you coming over? And I could honestly tell him I wasn't sure. And I walked out the front door of the church, and I could either turn left and run away (laughs) or... I could turn right and go to the funeral home. It was one of those times of, help me Jesus, help me now, okay? It took all the courage I had to go preach that first funeral. So, you might have had a time when you stepped up, when you did the right thing. It was Christmas Eve, 1981. We were on the interstate driving from Eureka to families in Decatur. It was foggy, it was bitterly cold, wind chill was minus 20 or more. There was ice all over the road, but we were being careful, going slow, getting passed by faster cars thinking, you dummy, we'll see you down the road. And we were taking the long exit ramp from 74 East on the 55 South, and there we saw it. In the middle of the ramp, cars stopped, facing at all angles. We couldn't stop. Somehow, we missed the pile and went into the ditch. So we're in the ditch, in our car, we're stuck. There's no way we're getting out of the snow And we say, okay, just sit in the car, just wait, help will come. If we get out, dangerous wind chills, people could die. So we're just sitting there, and a car hits our car. It popped the trunk lid. That was the extent of our damage. But we still stayed in the car until we heard someone scream, she's pinned under her car. So add panic to fear. Add confusion to panic and fear. And we thought, there's no way we can stay in the car. So we get out, and we see a white car, and behind the back tire, there are two legs sticking out. And these legs kick for a while, and then they're still. And one of the guys in the group, other people had gotten out of their cars, One of the guys in that group said, okay, men, you get on the rear bumper and lift, and I will pull her out. And you over here, you watch for more cars coming our way and let us know. So the men got on that rear bumper, and they picked up. And the guy reached in, grabbed her by the belt of her jeans, and pulled her out and rolled her over, face up, And she was blue, and she was breathing, and she was not bleeding, 
She was conscious, no broken bones. I can imagine her a few minutes earlier standing on the shoulder of that road, having clipped somebody's car, stopping on the shoulder, going to exchange information, insurance, and so on. State police already there on the shoulder. And a car comes into it and hits her car. That's the beginning of the pileup. And she dove into the ditch face first to get away from her spinning car. Her car spun around and slid into the ditch backwards and stopped on her. The trunk, the gas tank right over her, the back wheel against her hip. Can you imagine what's going through her mind? Is there another car coming this way? Is this how I'm going to die? But there were people who stepped up and did what it took, had the courage to save a life. That's not how it always works out, but in the midst of fear and confusion and panic, there is still an opportunity for courage that it is God's presence and God's power that gives us guidance, that gives us strength in those circumstances. And it's like nothing else. And I have to believe that's what Paul must have felt. An urgency, that he was paying attention and he could see the need and he could see what was his to do and he took action. So for us to see something, to pray about it, to get God's leading or God's nudging, pushing us into something, that we may have to get outside our comfort zone. And you say, Scott, I'm so far outside my comfort zone, I can't see it from here. Sometimes that's where we are called to be. Courage has at its root the Latin word cor, C-O-U-R, which means heart. So to have heart is to have courage. It was heartening to Paul to hear the words of God. One thing that I've mentioned briefly and will be in our next sermon series on the book of Ephesians that at the same time we're reading about the events in Acts, Paul is writing some of these letters to the various churches. And one of the things that he's doing in those letters is giving them encouragement. He knows them, he knows of their situation, and he knows that they need help. And he's saying to them, you can do this. So he's inspiring in them the spirit, the courage, the hope of what needs to be done. He cares deeply about them, and that's one way that he can help. From 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul writes, Keep alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Friends, those are verses worth memorizing. Let all that you do be done in love. Words of guidance, words of encouragement for them and for us. Ready for the big point this morning? Thought I'd never get there. What time is it? Okay. Here's the point of today's message. It is our turn to be courageous. It is our turn to be courageous. Like Paul, like the first century churches, our time has come to listen to God and to extend ourselves because of the gospel. It's time to set a path towards something other than the status quo, right? If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. And that's not the God path 
most times, right? There's a lot that is helpful, valuable, historic, sacred, who we are, and God works with that. And there's always something more and better and different that we can add to that without abandoning who we are at the core. So it's time to set our path. A friend of mine told me a story years ago, and I, I looked it up online, so I know it's true. <laughs> Centuries ago, when maps were drawn to help people travel from Europe to the New World, they were drawing everything that they knew, okay, as accurately as possible. But then there was the edge of the map, and they hadn't been to that territory unchartered waters. And the myth is that on some of those maps, especially East Asia, there were these words on the map. Here be dragons. Okay? You're not just afraid of falling off the edge of the earth. Here be dragons. That when you and I go into unknown territory... We're thinking, well, this is going to be dangerous. I say, yeah, maybe. You can tell I'm taking it very seriously, right? Because I'm thinking God's already there. God is putting us on this path. God is giving us what we need to go that direction and to be God's faithful people. So what does God's faithful future look like for us? What's going to change for us? I think that God is going to give us glimpses all along the way if we will turn our eyes in that direction and that we get a hint about the picture that God is painting for us. Something that I have believed for many, many years is that Every leader, and especially every leader in the church, should have their I have a dream speech. Okay? We know the iconic one from the 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr., but I'm talking about our I have a dream speech for this context. I think that needs to be a thoughtful, heartfelt expression about what the future can be for us. So do you think if I believe that, that I've got one? You want some hints? You want some ideas about what I think it looks like here? Okay, I saw two nods. I'm going ahead. I think some of our worship offerings in the future are going to be less formal, more interactive that we're going to be talking to one another about our faith in the context of a worship experience, and that people are going to be sharing their testimonies, their witnesses uh, in those settings. Second, I think that we'll have small groups in the church, and those small groups will offer two purposes, two things. One is a community of care, that people know one another, at a deeper level, and can provide pastoral care in the context of that group. You know, these are your best people. They're praying for you. They're walking that journey with you. Also in that small group is spiritual formation, that these are the people I'm growing in my faith with, and when we get together on a Sunday morning for worship, my people are going to be there, and we have that reunion time together. Thirdly, we will be leaders in the community, especially downtown. And we will be serving like Jesus served. That we will be healing and feeding and teaching and attracting people to life-changing experiences in this community. Now, some of that may sound pretty fuzzy, okay? That's all God has given me, that's all I got, but with time and your help, we're going to bring that into a sharper focus. 
when we know that it's from God and we know that it saves lives, then we'll have the courage to live this out. We'll have the gifts to make those new things happen. Like I said last week, I know that God has great things in store for us as a congregation. And I'll say it again, I'll say it over and over, I am all in. When it comes to creating the path forward, I know we can do this work together. Transition team is going to lead us in some visioning, I hope between now and the end of the year. And that's where you come in to be praying about what's next, to be praying about how can you help that happen. And I'll repeat another thing that I said, knowing you and knowing God makes me optimistic. You know, I look around this room and I say, this is what God has to work with? And I say, thank you, Jesus. The gifts are here. They're in abundance. And God is going to add more and more, and amazing things are going to happen. God is guiding our thoughts and our steps, just like the Apostle Paul. God is going to guide us, and God is going to fuel this mission. And God is going to give us the courage needed for the path ahead. If you'll pull out your bulletin and look at the challenge on the back, Number one, think of a fearful circumstance in your life and what was the source of the fear. And a prayer that goes right alongside that, if you'll pray this with me. Loving God, in times when I need courage, I pray I can feel you near. Encourage me to be brave in the midst of my fear in order to be faithful to you. I pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. God, we know we don't do this on our own. You are with us on this journey, and you surround us with loving family of faith. Live in us. Live through us, O God. Encourage us every day as you show us the way. We thank you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus. Our hymn of dedication this morning, a beautiful hymn, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies. Beautiful for spacious. 
Thank you, Lily. Thank you, David. Do you feel like you've celebrated a holiday? You're on the track, right? Enjoy the balance of your holiday weekend. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship experience this day. Go with an abundance of God's gifts and put courage at the top of that list. Go with God's peace. Amen. out the altar flowers? No, did you? No, I, 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 I spaced them off completely and I'm walking here and just before service I know that, whoa. Yeah, I, I meant to mention something about that. I would have thanked you. <laughs> so I'm not sure who to, I don't know, but we love it. Yeah. Red, white, and blue. Yeah, thanks so much.